スロスドーンシュeveryone and welcome to the Shiro Editor's Corner, a completely new and unscripted series of mini-casts. Come join your elder Shiro's as we reminisce on our favorite Saturn memories in this new and nostalgia-packed podcast series. Hey everyone, it's Saturn Dave, and this time around, I'm joined by the Sega guys. How are you guys doing? Can you introduce yourself for our listeners? Go on, James, you go first, mate. <laughs> oh, I was like, I don't want to step on your toes there, mate, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> Nice no, before uh, beauty. Well, that's true, mate. Not by much, <laughs> though. Come on. Um, yeah, my name's James. I, I go by the Segaholic on Twitter, one half of the Sega Guys podcast. Nice. And I'm Dan. Uh, Dan, the Mega Driver, as I know, the other half of the Sega Guys podcast. So I take it you are a 16-bit uh, aficionado. No, my specialty is the Saturn. Uh, I love the Saturn more than any other Sega console. If my surname was anything different, it would probably be Saturn related. But because my surname is Driver, it had to be Mega Driver. So Mega there Driver. You go. Oh, is that right? Your your last name is Driver. Okay. My last name is actually Driver. Yeah. So uh, nice. I, I love the Mega Drive anyway. So it's a no brainer. Excellent console, right? Oh. I always tell people it's Saturn, Dave, because I only have so much time with kids, and I'm like I have time to focus on one console and do content creation for one console and i don't know how you guys do it you guys have an awesome podcast the sega guys and as the name suggests you cover all of sega uh you've done interviews with ceos you've done interviews with uh game developers uh you've covered very specific topics like your next topic you're covering is cosmic smash right on the dreamcast very uh, kind of obscure title you know that people should definitely check out but you guys are all over the place when it comes to sega correct yeah we try <laughs> that's yeah. that's our fear that's all yeah. all over the place kind of sums us up mate doesn't it? <laughs> that's, not yeah. a bad, that's not a bad thing i mean it's kind of like sega lord x right I mean, obviously, he has a an affinity for Saturn. I think he gives that console a lot of love, which is why we're such good buddies. But but honestly, he's all over the place with Sega. You know, he's Sega Lord X. So, you know, I've really enjoyed quite a few episodes of your podcast. And uh, really, you know, congratulations on what number is it now that you're up to? 50th podcast episode. And yeah. Nice. Congrats. Coming up Thank to three you. years, we've been doing this now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the time goes by fast. <laughs> it, it really does. I it mean, does. it does. It does. Both James and I, our favorite Sega console is, funnily enough, the Sega Saturn as well. So, Oh, good. This is going to be fun then. Yes. Oh, well, uh, so Shiro is very much about building up the Saturn community, so making sure more people know about it. I, I always feel like the Sega Saturn, for a lot of people, is like a brand new console that they can get into and just discover a vast library of great games. It's no Jaguar, you know, with only a few good games. I mean, it's like if you were a PlayStation kid or an N64 kid and you completely slept on the Saturn, nowadays you pick one up, you're in heaven because you, it's like this entirely new retro console with hundreds of great games, right? You know, there's not a lot of trash on the Saturn. So it's great. My brother-in-law just picked one up, actually, and he's discovering And I'm like, I'm sorry because of the price. <laughs> but- I... <laughs> there you go. I mean, you know, cool. I'm glad that he's enjoying it, you know, and he's playing it with his daughter and stuff. But the thing that I want to do with our community is try to represent the UK more. We have quite a few members from the UK, um, but we've always been primarily US focused. We share a lot in common, but there's also some key differences as well. And that's what I kind of wanted you guys to help kind of explore for our listeners. What was the difference being a UK Saturn fan in the 90s? Um, I think the thing that I always remember is like up until the PlayStation actually came out, like I still remember there being like I was a teenager. Like whenever the Saturn came out, I'd just turned sixteen. So obviously Saturn came out here in July eighth, ninety five. So shortly after that kind of May launch in the US, but um, I do remember that there was kind of a, a good bit of hype like in school. You know, I remember like people being kind of all oh, like the Saturns out, and you know, there'd been like kind of like, little kind of snippets on various like, like, bad influence, and we'll talk about bad influence shortly, bad by influence, the way, yeah. <laughs> because in retrospect, the stuff that they had out with kind of feeds into that whole kind of media retail bias that we are going to kind of touch on a wee bit because that's something that was quite prevalent in the UK as a Saturn owner. But yeah, up until the PlayStation came out in September '95. 
like there was a kind of I don't know if you felt the same, Dan. There was a kind of excitement about it in general, but it was whenever the PlayStation came out and then that kind of whole media ramp up and the retail ramp up that it seemed to be that people just sort of dropped it. I mean, I remember obviously that the Saturn I've got just now is is a Saturn that Monkle got back in in you know July eighth ninety five on launch day and surprised me with it. And I won't get to that whole story because Dan's gone. Don't tell the story again, James. Man, you've told it about forty <laughs> times, but. You know, it was like whenever I went back into school on the Monday and I said, oh, my uncle picked up a Sega Saturn and they were like, no, he didn't. Nobody, nobody's got that yet. That's too new. No, and actually, I remember the following weekend, I actually stole the instruction manual out the box and smuggled it home and took it into school. Like, so I could prove to people in school that, we, that I actually had access to one because they didn't believe that anybody had paid 400 quid for this games console, you know, so. Oh, um, cool uncle. I he was, mate. I don't know. He just he, he clearly didn't have much other interests outside of technology because he just basically bought everything back in the nineties. It was crazy, but wow. um, I it was it did feel as if like between the launch periods, even though it did kind of sneak out, as we all know, there was kind of within your kind of circles of friends, there was a wee bit of kind of tangible excitement about it. And then PlayStation hit and it kind of dropped off. So mm. that that was a kind of experience from the kind of the launch time. I don't know if Dan, if you feel kind of you did any kind of similar experiences being slightly yeah. younger. <laughs> yeah, mostly. I mean, from for us in the UK, Nintendo weren't ever the dominant brand. Like ever, there was no massive wave of you know right. NES mainstream success in the UK because we were all playing on eight bit home computers like the Commodore 64, the Spectrum, and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then the Master System and Mega Drive hit, and they kind of dominated the market. So the UK was really a Sega dominated market for, for quite a while, we, from the Master System all the way up until late in the, ni- late in the life of the Mega Drive. Um, and what was interesting is that yeah, there was a lot of hype about the Sega Saturn at the time, but um, kind of similar to, to you guys in the US you did kind of get that feeling that Sega were panicking a little bit. I mean, mm. first with the 32X, um, and then obviously the Sega Saturn. As I say, I was, I was you know, a Sega maniac as a kid. I absolutely adored Sega. I used to read the Sonic the Hedgehog comic. I had all sorts of magazines, so I was trying to keep up on everything. And the Sega Saturn, for me, was this almost mythical machine. You had, obviously, you had the Mega CD, and that was extremely expensive. And then you had the uh, the Fate to X. I thought, well, the Fate to X looks like a good upgrade path. But then there's the Sega Saturn. I thought, well, that's going to be something I'm never going to be able to afford. That's going to be some sort of super super console that's going to be out of my reach, like the Mega CD is forever. Um, and yeah, and eventually it just kind of kind of snuck out. And the one thing, as I say, I listened. I've read Sonic the Comic, and I listened to a Sonic the Comic podcast. Um, and they go through issue by issue. Uh, not just the comics in there, but they used to cover the news stories, the charts and everything like that. And what's really apparent is when the Saturn launched in the UK, that coverage really just dies off. So that's something else that I've noticed in in the UK, especially looking back now, is how much Sega really just took their foot off the gas from a marketing perspective, whether they were, you know, pulled too far when they were trying to still promote the Mega Drive 32X and whatever, or whether it was just I don't know a lack of belief in the system uh, I don't know what it was but you can you can so well, I think very... you're right there it's a number of things right not not any one thing but it's like the fact that they were spread too thin the fact that there was a little bit of doubt on it they weren't like 100 percent on yeah this is great you know this hardware yeah. is great um because I mean even second themselves if we're being honest you know didn't really go all in on that dream of bringing full 3d arcade greatness that they had pioneered you know with like stuff like virtual fighter and daytona and virtual racing home to living room the way that sony did they were like that what they just did that's what we're going to do in the living room it's going to be amazing and it's just crazy that they they're the ones that pioneered that stuff in the arcade and then they didn't you know they were looking at the wrong targets right they're looking at jaguar and they were looking at 3do right so yeah you're right the management itself was like iffy on the console so there wasn't as much passion behind it but it is funny like how you say that the marketing was just terrible <laughs> i mean I and they, i mean they had a budget too like in in america they had 50 million dollars to spend on advertising they spent 30 million of it on that theater of the eye, could be Silverstein theater of the eye campaign, and then twenty million on print uh, through the Mednick Group, and I mean I would say that the print advertising was somewhat more effective. 
I never even saw Theater of the Eye back in the day. <laughs> like, it didn't even hit my radar. I, I, so I was like, they spent thirty million on that. Did you ever see the the advert? That, I mean, the, the, I only ever seen this advert once, and we all know the one, you know, with Valkyrie. You know, it's the guy who walks yes, into the yeah. bit, and you, know, you know, hey, that's Valkyrie. You know, does he design the games? No, he executes them. And that I seen that once on UK TV. You once. actually saw it back Shot in the day. Once, once. Wow. So that was McCann Erickson for you guys. That was the that was the firm, and and that was called Welcome to the Real World. That's right. Yeah, so I've seen all those things subsequently. I love it. It's so corny. It's so cheesy. But I mean, you know, and I love it. I love it ironically, right? But I mean, never saw any of that stuff back in the day. So that actually brings me to my first question for you guys. Um, how aware were you of the Saturn before it was really out? Like you talked about hype and, and being aware of it. Whereas like I was not aware of it, really aware of it at all. So tell me a little bit about that. Did Were you reading official Sega magazine or on TV? How did you hear about it before it launched? I mean, I know, Dan, obviously you you were more Sega-focused than I was at that time. I mean, my only kind of Sega console had been a Game Gear at that point. Again, the mm. kind of story that I've told before, you know, that basically I had a Spectrum, like Dan had mentioned. I had mm. this massive collection of games, briefcases. You see, in the UK, you used to get briefcases that held audio tapes and you would fill them with all your games. Oh, and yeah. I, and I sold those, um, you know, and basically it was a case of, you know, with the money, you can have a, a Mega Drive. Um, but unfortunately, my uh, one of my relatives stepped in and said, you know, no, I need an educational computer that can play games. So I didn't get a Mega Drive. Uh, I got an Atari ST. So mm. um, I was kind of shafted <laughs> in that kind of regard. <laughs> so my only kind of awareness of the Saturn up until I kind of was surprised with that one on launch day was like through like your bad influences your games masters any kind of like previews that you had magazine wise again i didn't buy multi-format mags i was only a teenager at the time so magazines were bought for me and again it was like you know st power and i had an amiga as well i moved on to an amiga it was like amiga format and so you know i did go to arcades and play sega games there like virtua fighter was a a big catalyst for me um getting really into sega and obviously having that on the, the saturn as well but i there was no no kind of general awareness up until the machine launched so i that that for me it was it was definitely a case of when i got the machine and then i seen the kind of awareness rising but you know yourself it was like tom kalinsky stood on stage at e3 and you can see the sweat pouring out the man's head. And, and we said that to him as well. Whenever we spoke to him, we said, Tom, we've watched that video back. And as you know, grainy as the footage is, we can see that as you're building up to that moment where you're going to go, you know, we should say a Saturn to retailers today. It's out there. And he's not wanting to say that. He's literally sweating at the point that he's he's not wanting to make that announcement. So, you know, it was just thrown out there. And I think... I don't know if it was perhaps something that maybe were Sega of Japan slightly, you know, not arrogant, but maybe misled because we know that Saturn did really well in Japan at launch. It was going toe to toe with PlayStation up until Final Fantasy VII kind of came out on PlayStation. And I don't know if maybe Sega of Japan were maybe buoyed by that kind of success that Saturn was doing so well. You know, I think was that Sega set aside a certain amount of units for launch, but they kind of held a back stock to kind of see them through to the end of the year, and those also sold out. So, did they maybe think, right, okay, it's doing well here, get it out now, get it out in the West? You know, let, that they arrogantly maybe thought that the success in Japan would translate to the same kind of anticipation in the West, and they just mismanaged it. The word you used earlier. So, in terms of awareness of it, I had. You know, I had no awareness of it until it actually hit and other than kind of very fleeting kind of mentions and like your bad influence, Games Master, things like that. What about you, Dan? I mean, for me, I was, as I say, I, I was, I'll say it now, I was a Sega fanboy back in the day, huge Sega fanboy, had all the Sega magazines, as I said, I collected the comic and stuff. So I was very aware of it from that perspective. And as I said, for me, it seemed like this almost, almost mythical machine that I could never get, like un unobtainable almost. Um but that being said, it did just kind of slip out. See, I was I was reading things like um, Me Machines, Official Sega Magazine, uh, Sega Power, um, and looking at the screenshots and of like Virtual Fighter and Daytona, and thinking, wow, and thinking, I wonder when it's going to hit. 
and then it wasn't until I actually went to a went to a short store and saw that Pan's Dragoon was on a rolling demo. I was like, "Hang on, this thing's actually out." I thought it wasn't going to be out until the end of end of this year, yeah. uh, which which was crazy to me. Uh, I never actually saw any adverts for it, not on the telly. And I think one thing that is quite you know obvious now looking back is when uh, I first saw the Master System or Mega Drive. Um, a lot of the time I had family members and I'm talking like aunts and uncles who had the consoles, but there was no one kind of in that demographic that, that had a Saturn. So I think right from the off, you could tell that it didn't get that sort of that mainstream, uh, attraction, not, not like right. the PlayStation did. Um, but yeah, I, I was aware of it, but only because I was someone who was kind of, you know, keeping up to date with everything Sega, the best way that you could as a, as a team back in, back in the nineties, just through print media. But there was yeah. nothing in terms of you know television commercials or anything like that that really showed you no, like this amazing machine is out there now. It just kind of appeared one day. That's how it felt anyway. It's funny because I've come to realize over time that there were ads in the United States, but I didn't see them because they were on like Saturday morning cartoons and they were on like the, the cartoon time slots that elementary school kids would come home and watch. We were in high school, right? We probably weren't watching those cartoons anymore, right? We were watching like The Simpsons on primetime or we were watching like more primetime stuff, right? And there were no Saturn ads in primetime, you know? I just found out about like a Knight's Sweepstakes that was on Fox Kids. And it was something that I posted on Twitter and people were like, oh yeah, I saw that. It was on the morning cartoons. And I was like, well, there you go. I wasn't watching morning cartoons. I was uh, like a sophomore in high school and thinking about girls and thinking about, you know, technology, stuff like that, driving a car, you know, that. so it's like, it didn't hit because we were basically like the target market for this thing, but we weren't hearing about it when it comes to advertising, whereas Sony was like very smart. They knew as well that we were the target market. They were going to go for a little bit more mature audience and they were going to go for a grassroots campaign where they put the machines in clubs and they put the machines in, in the mall and, you know, let people try it they'll be converted when they actually play it. And I mean, you, you can't fault them for that. They did an amazing job marketing that machine, you know? Oh, they did. I mean, I was showing James the other day, uh, a Nights into Dreams advert that I'd seen once, so once on, on TV. And, and mm-hmm. the, ad, the ad is absolutely atrocious. It's like... Uh, well, which one is it? Does it make sense? Um, God, how to explain it. It talks about doing tricks and stuff to rack up yeah. a high score, which if you're going to, you know, that niche hardcore gamer audience you know right. fantastic but if you're trying to get the mass market it made no and then in the meanwhile i think sony i remember very early on sony had some advert with people doing tests on chimps and stuff which was, oh, yeah. it was <laughs> funny right. and edgy. i remember um, that one yeah, yeah. The, the, the chimpanzee sitting there playing absolutely the game, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we saw them saw them multiple times and remember them right so sony had that sewed up but sega mm. just were just fumbling which is so frustrating because I know you're very Saturn focused, but I don't know if you've ever seen any of the old pirate TV ads in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Familiar with them subsequently. Yeah. Yeah. So those those ads were, were huge in the UK. Um, there was even a comic strip about them. Mm-hmm. And that ad, that campaign was so successful successful yeah. in that period. And it's just crazy to think that, you know, in just a couple of years, those ads were what, 93? I think even 94, you had the Sonic and Knuckles ad, which did really well. And then in the space yeah, of a year or two, it's just taken a nosedive and it's like so good that Sega don't know how to, to market it anymore. It's uh, it's crazy. Oh, I mean, they garnered the majority of the market in the 16-bit era in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is huge, right? And I mean, Tom Kalinske, like it or not, because I know Sega of Japan did not like how much money he spent, but I mean, you know, he was going for the install base, right? He was like, he established the install base, the dividends will come back in the end through software sales and stuff. But it, it's a long game. It's not a short game, you know? But essentially, they gained the uh, majority of the market through brilliant advertising. I mean, we knew about Sega TV, you know, we knew about all the Sonic games and the Vector Man and everything like that. It was just very, very well promoted. But again, at that time, I was also younger and I was watching cartoons at that point. So maybe it was always the same. I don't know. Maybe they thought they could just do the same stuff that they did during the 16-bit era and that it would fly. But of course, little kids like that don't have the money to buy a Saturn and they probably can't convince their parents to buy them one either, you know? And for us... So I I don't even think they did in the UK I, like, you're saying like, they continued doing what they did in the 16-bit era like it, 
it's almost as if they just they just dropped it off a cliff. It was like they just Dan was talking about the pirate radio. The cyber razor cut is like legendary in the UK. You know, Jimmy, the, the cybernetic gamer with his, his, his robot arm, you know, it's you know, the, the barber, you know, the cyber razor cuts. And right. you know, <laughs> that you know, and, and you know, Jimmy became you know, it was almost like the next ad was almost like part of like a series. You know, they always had a different theme. Like there was like he was playing a Game Gear and he was like dancing outside. He had a, like a trailer that he would, he would game in, like a Sega trailer. And he was there's, there's one advert for Super Monaco GP on the Game Gear, and he's he's, he's dancing away suavely, arms around this beautiful woman, and he's like, ah, you know, finding gaming times tough. Unless you've got yourself one of these, and he looks over her shoulder, <laughs> and he's playing Super Monaco GP behind her back on a Game Gear, but nice. she thinks that she's getting serenaded with this lovely dance, and it's like you know, all the adverts like he would be like fighting like kind of ninjas who were trying to come in his 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 roof to kind of steal his console, and every ad always had something kind of different and clever about it, and then they just stopped. It's mm-hmm. like they had built up a, a brand, you know, like the, the kind of Sega Skull as well. You know, the, the you know, I think you guys had the Sega Skull as well. They the kind of it screamed mm-hmm. Sega as well. But, you know, there was like, they just stopped doing what they'd done so well. And it's yeah. it's just bizarre that you would have such a successful marketing campaign. I mean, that theatre of the eye thing, I mean, it just doesn't make sense because, like, they've got this big purple-headed guy standing there talking, oh, yeah. lo- looking like Kratos, and then this stoner guy just walks like in Kratos. off the... <laughs> it, it, it looks like Kratos. But, it does. <laughs> but, but then this mad stoner guy walks in for the right-hand side. Yeah, man. And I'm like, what? <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, what? what Creamy is the... 3D graphics. You got this big, like, uh, prison inmate wearing a tutu, you know, wearing a, like, ballerina tutu. Like, what is that I... all about? And he's like, I... bug. You know, so so that, that was $30 million. I always say to Peter, like, imagine if they took that $30 million and they just bought Saturns. They just used it on stock and rented kiosks in the mall, you know, and put Saturns all around for like kids to play for free. There you go. They, you know, the kids would go home and be like, mom, dad, I got to get this console, right? You know, like imagine if they just spent that money on letting people play Saturn. That's what Sony did, you know, to a large degree. They had more money. It's Sony, mm-hmm. you know, they're a powerhouse. But I mean, they did that and, and it did work. You know, they just were like the product will sell itself kind of thing, you know. But that theater of the eye was just, and and honestly, the welcome to the real world was not that much better. No. <laughs> you no. had his eyes, the Daytona, you know, with the eyes coming That's out right. you know, through the tubes. You know? <laughs> what were they thinking? What what you said there as well, I what were they thinking, you know, about like Sony going out into the clubs, into the malls and things like that. Like again, as much as the PlayStation and the focus on 3D and that kind of custom silicon was, you know, driven by seeing Virtua Fighter, mm-hmm. it's almost like their retail strategy was also derived from watching how Sega in America took on Nintendo. Like oh, yeah. again, it's in console wars. Tom well, spoke they about had it. Steve I'll... Race. Steve Race was the marketing VP, and then he, he jumped ship and he went exactly. over to the enemy. You know, they they took the Mega Drive or the Genesis on tour. You know, and they had it out there and let kids. You know, the, it was like the kind of the video game version of the Pepsi Challenge. You know, it's like mm. try this, try that. Which one do you prefer? And mm-hmm. again, Sony did that well. The club scene was massive, especially in the UK. Like yeah. having Wipeout and having Prodigy on there. You know, oh, yeah. that 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 was huge. Like, because again, you were hitting that kind of 16, 17 year olds, you know, were starting to sneak into clubs at the age of 17, underage, and all that with your fake right. ID and stuff, you know, thinking you were cool, you know. And even if the... you were 14, you wanted to be those kids. You know, you wanted exactly. to hang out with those kids because that you was You wanted cool. to be in with the cool kids. So, yeah, right. I don't know. I don't know why they. They, they didn't just continue doing what they had done before. They had a blueprint and Sony followed it and Sega just went, ah, we don't need that anymore. So one thing you guys did have is a really strong Sega loyalty, just ingrained, like like you guys said. You also have a much denser focus population. You know, I mean, I think the UK is smaller than the state of California, right? You know, and the US is, it's just spread out so much, right? Whereas with the UK, if you were a Sega fan or a Saturn fan, there's a much better chance that you'd run into another Saturn fan in the UK than you would in the United States, which I can honestly say I was a complete loner. <laughs> like, I, I don't think, I had to bring my little brother along for the ride and he was a little reluctant <laughs> but, but i was like i need somebody else to play this console with you know did you have friends through high school that were saturn fans or played saturn one 
Yep. One here as well. So Wow. Okay. So maybe I need to eat my hat on that. <laughs> That's why I was sitting shaking my head and everything you were saying about you. You're like, no. It's an easier chance to run into a Saturn owner. Nope. Yeah. It was literally one person, me and my best mate, Sam, in school. We, were the, we felt like it was us against the world at that time. It was, it was the same for me as well. <laughs> yeah. But then in 98, at least you got to buy a bunch of cheap games, right? <laughs> well, uh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. So maybe there's not that much difference. <laughs> I always get the sense, though, that there was definitely a much stronger Sega loyalty. And I mean, I think that that did continue with the Dreamcast, you know. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just dreaming that up. <laughs> because, I mean, the Dreamcast had a great, like, one, one and a half year run here, too, you know. And it was an amazing console, but again, it was just Sony was such a juggernaut. And by that time, Sega had made so many bad decisions. It was like they could have done everything perfect and it still wouldn't have been enough, you know? Yeah, I think everyone was still just waiting for the PlayStation 2. I I think that's why, you know, both in the UK and the US, it had such a a massive start. And me and James talked about this in the past about the Dreamcast. We're both sitting there, you know, watching the releases and being like, yes, Sega are back. (laughs) Because, you know, that's that Sega loyalty, as you say. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone went out there and just, who was, who was a Sega diehard went out and bought it. Um, Mm -hmm. And then once, once all the diehards bought it, the, the mass market were all waiting for the PlayStation too. But yeah. um, but yeah, from uh, my perspective, I mean, yeah, I literally had one friend. Uh, it wasn't a close friend. It was just the only person I knew in my school with a Sega Saturn. <laughs> so um, which I, everyone, everyone was PlayStation, PlayStation, PlayStation. And then the N64 came out and a handful of people mm-hmm. actually got their N64s. Um, the one thing was that I did quite like in, you know, educating people on the on the Sega Saturn, <laughs> much as we hope to do today. Uh, mm-hmm. One one memorable night, and I'm going off on a tangent here, but one memorable night was um, my friends were all like, "Oh, let's all let's all play some Golden Eye," and uh, uh, I think it was WrestleMania 2000 on the N64, and we'll bring our N64 controllers around and blah blah blah. So I was like, "Yeah, I'll bring my Saturn," and they're like, "Yeah, if you want to." Uh, so I brought around my Sega Saturn. At this point, I had uh, a had had multi tap, a bunch of pads. Uh, winter heat but most importantly guardian heroes oh nice i think i, had, I, think I had duke nukem as well with death tank and um long story short the the n64 ended up not even getting turned on we played guardian heroes for something like 12 straight hours wow. <laughs> and then everyone uh, about three of my friends that year ended up getting sega Saturns for christmas that was christmas 1997 that's console a was discon- game <laughs> yeah especially the the multiplayer mode yeah yeah oh, <laughs> yeah it the multiplayer is amazing isn't that that's crazy too like um if you played the right games even the sega cd i often say like people think it's trash or that it just had a bunch of garbage titles like S- sewer shark what was the other one that was like really popular with the night you trap? know night trap there you go but i mean you know there's a lot of great titles on the sega cd a lot like Pop Full Mail and like uh, Snatcher and like some great stuff that if people had played those games, they might have a better opinion of the console, right? Well, same with you, you know, they 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 think of Saturn as, you know, like maybe that janky Daytona or whatever, right? You know, which by the way, I love Daytona. I think it's it plays great. You know, it just doesn't, you know, I, pop in, be damned. But uh, like if they saw that, that was their initial impression versus like Ridge Racer, right? But if their first impression was, like you said, uh, Guardian Heroes, playing a game like that, it just completely changes your mind about the console you know you realize there's such gems on that console you know i i mean what you said there about daytona by the way we we have <laughs> championed daytona on our oh, show yeah. like until the ps360 version there was no other home version of daytona that had the handling nailed like you said pop and so be fun. damned it's like yeah, yeah. it just it feels like you're it, it, it captures the feel of the arcade handling mm-hmm. to an absolute t and mm-hmm. I think it doesn't, again, it's, it's like there is no Virtue Fighter as well. You know, like, I don't know if you guys find this as well, but there's a, a, an awful lot of kind of like revisionism that goes on where, you know, mm-hmm. v- Virtue Fighter Remix was an apology for how bad the first game, that's why Sega made it, it was an apology for how bad the port was for the original. And it's, well, no, it wasn't because it was behind the scenes at E3 95. So right, it, yeah. it, was all, it was well underway. And again, like, people look back and say, oh, it was maligned, it was criticized, but, edge in the uk mm-hmm. like is like the kind of 
the high end multi format oh, yeah. magazine. They, they scored that nine out of ten. The Japanese it plays version. Well. It it's, plays well. It's great. It's it's yeah. a great port. It's, okay, there's some kind of pol- you know polygonal glitching going on, but again, it's just that kind of thing that it does go on. That there's that kind of you know maybe kind of rewriting of the narrative there. But Daytona, it's just. I, I love Daytona. Dan loves Daytona. It just handles so well. And especially again, kind of for us as well, like going out and now being able to kind of play these games at 60 hertz because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously 50 hertz, we didn't have the kind of Dreamcast 60 hertz switch that we, we eventually right. got. So Daytona in the UK was really badly letterboxed, but it was PAL optimized. So it was a really kind of weird halfway house where it looked like a really badly PAL optimized game because it had giant borders, but Sega artificially sped it up and PAL optimized it. So it felt as fast as the NTSC version. Mm. So now you can kind of have the best of both where you can stretch it right out now whenever you've got your start and switch, you know, but yeah, no, exactly. you're right in that. If you show people the right games, you know, and Dan and I laugh because I think, we say that Sega should give us retrospective commission because the amount of Saturns that we've <laughs> that we've sold is like we, we can go to double figures and people in the kind of UK retro community who have come to us and, and kind of asked for advice on Saturns and modding Saturns and kind of stuff like that. So aye, it's just it's it's just it's it's mad to think that you know there's that kind of big community out there that are still finding the machine for the first time and mm-hmm. and as, as you said to some people it is like a like a new console for these people but if you show them the right games, like mm. I always think, what would have happened if Sega had not brought the launch forward, you know, mm. to May and July, but rather than brought it forward two, three months, delayed it? Can you imagine if we had launched with like the big three? If you they put, would have had a better launch lineup, that's for if, sure. I if mean, you several put, games that were in the in the oven I, and were not cooked yet, you know, you know, like, you mentioned about like Daytona, um, not Daytona, like, like Ridge Racer, like. Sure. Now, I think Ridge Racer is, can you swear on this? Shite, right? I don't, I'm not. It's I, not I'm, that great. No. It's, <laughs> it, People can burn me alive. I don't care. But it's not, it's not as fun nowadays no, as no. Daytona USA. Like Daytona USA is an off the rails roller coaster ride. Um, it's not Sega Rally. Like Sega Rally is like pinpoint precision, yes. you, you know, just shaving seconds off your time and that feeling of like perfect control. Daytona USA, you're supposed to feel a little bit out of control. Like you're just careening down the course. You're going to almost crash into a wall, but you're drift. Somehow you pull off the drift and that music is, you know, you'll burn up the tires. You know, it creates this like frantic energy where you just like you're hyped and you're in the zone, you know. But games back then were weighted. We were just smoking the new graphics. <laughs> and it's like if you didn't, if there was a little bit of clipping or a little bit of popping or anything like that, you weighted things so heavily. Some games got terrible scores just because they were 2D. Some games got terrible scores just because they were FMV based. Even if they were the pinnacle of FMV, like Lunacy, you know, or, um, you know, Enemy Zero or whatever, they'd be weighted by uh, journalists that would say, oh, well, it's not the cutting edge. It's not what we're all about right now, you know? So that was kind of sad. But you mentioned commission, you know, you mentioned uh, if you guys had commission and selling Saturns. <laughs> Did you feel like shop clerks would really steer you towards PlayStation, would steer you away from the Saturn, you know? Oh, yes. This this is a topic, Dan. I think we like, could. Did they think really... they were doing you a favor, <laughs> or were it they was... paid? <laughs> well, that that's the thing. We we now retrospectively looking at to, and looking at the kind of media stuff like with bad influence, right? And I'll, okay, I come back to the retail bit in a minute. But if you look at bad influences footage now, right? Like well, Andy Crane and Violet Berlin are standing there and they're kind of talking. I've got the both machines in from Japan, you know, and, and Andy Crane says, you know, that the the PlayStation is half the size of the bulky Saturn. No, it's not. The Saturns are square. If you flatten it down, yeah. PlayStation's a thinner rectangle. Saturns are square. That's thicker, right? But it's not half the size. You know, they talk about, you know, um, PlayStation um, comes with enough memory to save one or two save games doesn't mention the fact that the Saturn actually comes with built-in storage to save exactly then they say the PlayStation comes with their games on funky black CDs then they go the Saturn can play (laughs) games on and that and this is what makes me look back and think you were paid off because like it's just maybe old Sega fanboy paranoia coming in right but they talk about the Saturn and he says the Saturn plays its games on older carts as well as disc. So straight right. away, they put out older carts first. 
So instantly in your head, you you hear funky black CDs versus older car oh, and discs. Which was misinformation was, as it is. Yeah. So <laughs> And then on top of that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so at the time you, you didn't pick up on it, you know, but looking back at it now as a kind of adult who's witnessed a console work up at the conclusion in terms of Sega as a hardware company, you look at it and you go, you know, these guys like Andy, Andy Kane and Violet Bullard, they were scripted, they were told what to say by the, the TV execs. Mm-hmm. You know, so you just can't help but think, were you? Like, was there some kind of brown paper envelope with a wad of cash in it to tell you to to just maybe make the PlayStation seem that bit more attractive? Because, like, they got so hyped about Ridge Racer, about Virtua Fighter, which is a conversion of, you know, a cutting-edge coin-op. You know, okay, Ridge Racer was a, a decent conversion, but not as high-end in terms of arcade tech as what Virtua Fighter was on the Model 1. So there was no excitement over it. The excitement on the PlayStation end was absolutely tangible from them. And then the retail aspect of it is that you would go into shops and, you know, you would you would actually hear, like, shop clerks and whatnot or kind of guys behind the counter saying, you know, someone would go up and go, oh, I'm interested in a Sega Saturn. And they would go, you know, oh, that, that's great, but have you heard of the PlayStation? You know, or someone would ask for a copy of Virtua Fighter, but oh, have you heard of Tekken? You know, and like you'd mentioned, like um, Panzer Dragoon running there, you know, down in a rolling demo. We had that in Game Zone in Partick. And I remember this greasy haired guy wearing a suit with shoulder pads. It was obviously his dad's for his wardrobe because it was way too big for him. And it was like people coming in and going, wow, look at what, what game is this? Oh, it's Panzer Dragoon for the Saturn, but it's not that good. And I'm like, really? You know, so, and I yeah. thought it was just me. And then I met Dan. And Dan has the same stories, and then people on Twitter who listen to us have also went, oh, that happened to me. So it's just, it was so prevalent that the retail bias was absolutely, it was there. It was 100% there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it happened to me. It happened to me when I went to buy my Sega Saturn. I mean, I I posted recently, actually, about, you know, I saved up my paper round money. It was first to get a 32X, and then when I saw the writing was on the wall for that, it was like, okay, well, get a Saturn, and thankfully... As I saved the money, the price in the UK went down. Um, so, you know, my target became a Sega Saturn. And that's all. It was always going to be a Sega console. I, I did play a, a PlayStation on a demo part in a, in a Sony store in the UK. And uh, I remember thinking that the controller was horrendous. I was like, well, absolutely no way am I going to touch that thing. <laughs> it's Sega all the way. So my birthday comes around. I get my birthday money. I go to uh, Comic, which is a, a retail electrical store. In, I think it's still going here in the UK. I go there with my with my mum and my and my dad and my brother and sister. We all go in there, and I've got my my cash to go and buy my console, and I'm so excited for it. And uh, we asked the guy, you know, I, I want we want this Sega Saturn free game bundle. He's like, "Are you sure you want a Sega Saturn though? You know, don't you want a don't you want a PlayStation? No, I want a Sega Saturn. But have you seen Crash Bandicoot? You know, don't you want to play Crash Bandicoot? Well, actually, I want to play Nights into Dreams. That's you know, that's the first game I'm going to get after this. No, but Crash Bandicoot is better. And even my mum said to me, "Are you sure you don't want to get want to get a PlayStation?" Now, now <laughs> rewinding back a little bit, <laughs> the, I I got the Sega Saturn because I went there and I knew what I wanted. If I'd said to my parents, "Can you get me a Sega Saturn for my birthday?" and they they had the money to get me the console outright themselves, there's every bit of chance that they went there to buy a Sega Saturn. And came back with a PlayStation, and I unwrapped that, you know, on my on my on my thirteenth mm. birthday. Um, and it's similar. We were talking to Tom Sharnock from the Dreamcast Junkyard in a in a recent the podcast hasn't gone live yet, but he was saying very much the same thing to the point that when his mum used to go and buy him a game, when she went to the store to pick it, pick up a Sega Saturn game, she came back with the PlayStation version of that same game. Mm-hmm. That they that they were saying this version is better, so it was absolutely rife in the UK. Um, yeah, yeah, I experienced it firsthand. I mean, I guess it's the same. It's the same here because uh, I wouldn't get a Saturn until a year later because of a clerk who basically steered me away from it. Like I went into the store and asked, "Is there a home machine that can play Daytona?" And he was like, "Well, yeah, there is, but it's not that great, and it doesn't have a lot of great games. You should really check out the PlayStation Ridge Racer. You know, check this out, Jet Moto, right?" And it was impressive. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, it, it was it was good. And my dad liked it. So we brought home a PlayStation, you know. 
and I guess luckily you could say he's a musician and he took the PlayStation on the road so often that I needed my own console again. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to try to look back into the console that plays Daytona, you know? And funny enough, it was like Christmas 96. I was queued up in a really long line to test out Mario 64, right? And everybody gets like 20 minutes or something. So it's going to take forever, right? My, my parents are shopping for Christmas. I'm going to blow my entire time at the mall just waiting in this line. And right to the side of me, just squirreled away on this little CRT is Knights, the attract mode for Knights. And I'm just like, is anybody seeing this? Like the elephant in the room here? Like, does anybody see like how awesome this looks? What am I, am I the only one who's, and I'm just like, how is it that I've not noticed this game yet? Because it was released several months the summer prior, you know, I was just like, how is this just hitting my radar now? Well, it's because I'm a captive audience. I'm standing here in a line and I can't go anywhere. So I'm like looking at this attract mode for Knights and I'm just like, this is just the most bizarre but amazing thing I've ever seen. Why am I standing in this line to play Mario 64? <laughs> but to get into Saturn, it's like you really had to like seek it out and you had to ignore all the naysayers, you know? Aye. I mean, you mentioned Comet as well, Dan. You know, and again, I remember that actually annoyed a Sony rep because I, I witnessed this. I kind of Dan's heard this story as well. We've talked about this in the podcast. Sony used to send reps into UK stores and they would be there with their wee Sony badge, all kind of proud as punch, and they'd be rearranging the the, the shelves to make oh, sure yeah. that, that PlayStation was very, you know, prominently, Prominent. properly displayed. You know, so... And they would move, like, N64 and Saturn stuff out the way. So this guy turned around and he's, he's just literally looked back and I'm there with my mate Sam. We used to always kind of go to all the kind of game shops at the weekend and just walk about and kind of check what was new. <laughs> and I started putting the Saturn games back up onto the top shelf and this guy's just nice. looking at me as if to go, really? And I'm like, it's just absolute blatant retail bias that's going on there. You know, it's like, yeah. what, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> you rearranged it. That's great. <laughs> Well, I'm not. I'm not having this. This is just. But that was the thing as well. You talk about you know that you see knights on a CRT packed out the way in a corner, and again, like I get I, my copy of Virtua Fighter Two. I got that about a week after it came out, and it was on the bottom shelf in a store in a, uh, called Beaties, which is no longer in the UK. Is Beaties still going, Dan? I've not, I don't think I've, so. I've not seen no, one for a while. No, but basically it was like a kind of hybrid toy computer shop. They did like model railways, like the old miniature kind of like Warhammer style stuff and all that toys and, and, and video games. But um, their Saturn stuff, this was a brand new release. One of the biggest arcade machines, a Model 2 port, and it was on the bottom shelf like, like some bargain bin game. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. stuff like Ridge Racer was still getting like top shelf, you know, beside Wipeout and Tekken and all this was all getting prominently beautifully displayed. Mm -hmm. And that is what kind of went on as time passed. Like Saturn sections got smaller and smaller. You're right, you did have to kind of really seek out Saturn stuff. If it wasn't on the bottom shelf, it was packed in a wee like a corner, like a dirty secret. You know, it was like like retailers all oh, we've got this stuff, but we don't really want to put it on right. display. Just shunt it out there, out the way. So, I, you're right. You did really, if if you were looking for for kind of new Saturn content, you really did have to go searching for it. I used to think that it was a conspiracy or something. <laughs> now I'm just thinking in hindsight <laughs> that if they sell a Saturn they're probably thinking, well, we're not going to sell that much software. You know, I mean, honestly, if, if they sell a bunch of PlayStations, they know that the support is there and they know that they're looking at their list of games that are coming, you know, and they're like, well, we're going to be able to make a bunch of money in commissions on, on games and stuff like that. Because as we all said, we were like the one person that bought a Saturn, right? And they probably knew that. So, I mean, you know, yeah, I used to think that they got paid off. The truth is we do know that Sony paid for exclusivity for Tomb Raider 2, right? So they pretty much blocked Sega there. And so that kind of trickled down, you know, because if that stuff was happening on the corporate level, well, then Sega, they don't have as many games coming out on the roster. Game shops see that. They're like, well, we're going to make so much more money if we push the PlayStation because, you know, they're going to buy the machine, then they're going to need games for it. We're going to sell a bunch of games. And who cares if the one guy cries because we're not supporting the Saturn, you know? So, I mean, they probably weren't being paid under the table, but they were making a lot more selling PlayStations. So, you know, it just didn't make sense to them from a business sense to sell Saturns, but it's yeah. sad. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think you can't discount the fact that 
Sony were already a retail juggernaut, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hi-Fi systems, Walkmans, TVs, the, the lot. It might not have been, you know, brown envelopes under the table, but it may have been, you know, if you sell this many yeah. PlayStations, then we'll reduce your cost to buy these TVs or we'll give you this much extra stock or any, anything like that. I mean, Sega yeah. were literally just Sega and the Saturn and maybe a dwindling Mega Drive or Genesis library. But Sony, if you're a, again, if you're a retailer like, you know, Comet or any of the electrical re- retailers that we went to, they already had all the relationships. Absolutely. They, yeah, they already had the relationships with the retailers. You're right. And they had priority because they could leverage the fact that we're giving you dibs on all this other stuff too. You, all, you know, oh, you're yeah. right. Absolutely. They had more power to, to kind of push their weight around for sure. And everyone underestimated Sony, didn't they? Even the media, you'd say, oh, well, Sony is going to have this new... And it's called the PlayStation, which honestly I thought was a really stupid name for a console at the time. You play, so yeah, because that's what you do on it, right? You play. But I mean, everyone underestimated them thinking, oh, well, they're an electronics manufacturer. What business do they have coming into the games market? But man, did they show us. <laughs> they showed yeah, I, everybody. I blame yeah. Phillips. If, they, if Phillips hadn't messed up with the CDI, then <laughs> we might have taken Sony seriously. Oh, yeah, for sure. What are your thoughts on SOE? I've talked to a lot of UK fans and it seems like there's a little bit of like Tom Kalinske hate. (laughs) Like I've, I've heard a lot of folks saying, Oh, I don't think that he was a good, uh, a good CEO in America or whatnot. And I'm just wondering, like, how do you feel SOE did compared to SOA? You know, what what are your thoughts? I mean, is it just all about the same? (laughs) I, I think in terms of, kind of western presence when it comes to the Saturn I think we we felt quite kind of detached I think in terms of like I think Sega of America always had that kind of clear leadership and I see a lot of people kind of like I don't know why like all liar liar Tom Kalinske and all that kind of stuff and everything he says he's, he's like a used car salesman I'm like that's that's really really harsh you know like again speaking to him Lovely man, his 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 stories are out there. Like, there's people that don't believe the kind of Hayao Nakayama story. You know, they they, mm-hmm. they don't they don't. There's no way he found them on a beach in Hawaii. That's just completely made up kind of stuff. And it's, I think he gets a lot of unfair criticism of what impact he had on Europe's, um, you know, actual marketing or kind of decisions that were taken with the system and, or games that came out or games that came over from Japan. I, I don't think he he would have had much of a say, but. Where I felt Sega of Europe really dropped the ball, and again, we've talked about this on our show, is that when it came to the Dreamcast, right, we all knew it was a kind of last shot. And you'd mentioned earlier about the kind of market and budget for the Saturn in the West and what they spent it on, theatre of the eye. In Europe, Sega of America, for some ungodly known reason, or should say Sega of Europe decided to sponsor football teams or soccer teams. And oh, wow. So, the, like, Arsenal had Dreamcast on their shirts, St. Etienne, Sampdoria, and uh, Deportivo La Coruña was the one in Spain. And you're thinking, how much money did you spend? Because, like, the big one was Arsenal, right, who at the time were kind of one of the, the major teams. Sorry, Dan. Uh, kind of like I'm a Spurs fan. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Okay. Hate, hate them, but there we go. Uh, so, <laughs> it's, um, you know... And the Premier League, as we know, is a big money magnet. So to sponsor a Premier League team costs a lot of money. So then there was the ads, there was the barber, you know, which, you know, again, tried to play on the multiplayer aspect. You had the office workers opposite ends of the the, the glass staircase, which was meant to be a, an advert for Sonic Adventure, where they race each other downstairs and get to the revolving door. Mm. And they didn't show enough gameplay. Now, th- this was a system that at the time, blew everybody away in terms of visuals, as much as Sony, uh, you know, tried to position the Dreamcast as a kind of a stepping stone product until PlayStation 2. You know, Peter Moore said that to us when I spoke to him as well, is that, you know, Sony did a very good job of that, of of pushing the Dreamcast as a kind of a transitional product before. You know, you, you can buy your Dreamcast, but we all know you're going to buy a PlayStation 2. So Sega Europe didn't really do a great job. I think they, they tried to be Sony and tried to do lifestyle things. So Sony did clubs, we'll do football, you know, or soccer, we'll, we'll sponsor soccer teams. But right. why didn't you just spend all that money on witty, clever, gameplay-filled ads? Like, I remember going to the cinema and it was was the episode one The Phantom Menace was on. Mm-hmm. 
and and the, I'm sure it was that and the Barber advert played and you know Dreamcast up to six billion players and it's like what's a Dreamcast mate there's no gameplay like it's just a guy racing another guy cutting somebody's hair it's like it didn't make any sense it's like you know so they had all that money and again they just flushed it down the toilet no wonder Sega were close to going under the way that they wasted money especially on marketing they just did not apart from that one period with the pirate tv and the cyber razor cut stuff in the uk which was nailed down totally successful they just dropped the ball with it imagine if they took all that money and just used it to put a dvd drive in the, in the <laughs> well there you go mate. <laughs> uh, you know i mean uh like i was selling dreamcasts at that time and just begging people i was like can't you look at all these great games wall of games and, and then over here you had fanta vision on the PS1. but they were like but i can play the matrix on it <laughs> i can put my oh, dvd God. in there you know and i'm just like seriously <laughs> that's what you you get fanta vision and the matrix dvd you know it, it was crazy though seriously i think the dreamcast was pretty much a perfect console and that was the one thing dvd drive Forget the mill CD, forget the GD-ROM. People didn't figure out how to burn DVDs until way after the console would have made all of its money. You know, and that's the one thing. It's like, I just wish it had a DVD yeah. drive. But oh, well, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. You have to, I, I don't want you to go yet, James. I have so many more questions for you, but I know uh, you do. Until, until I get chased, mate, we can just keep going. Okay, okay. So why don't we talk about some of the things that you guys had that we didn't have and vice versa? Because actually we're kind of jealous of you guys for like, you got Deep Fear, you got KO2, you got uh, you got some cool games that we didn't get, and then we we got a couple games like we got a stall, which was weird. You guys didn't get that, right? No, we didn't. No, no you didn't get it. Okay, that's no. a weird one to not get. I don't know why. You, and then no, we got Netlink, and they didn't bring it out in the UK, which was really weird, you know. But then again, n- not a lot of people got it in the US either. <laughs> <laughs> what what are some of the, what are some of the games that uh, that you guys got that that you really like that we didn't get? Are there any that come to mind? Like KO2, are you are you a fan? I didn't play KO2 until quite a while after, so I'm, I'm like guilty there. Yeah. Okay. I played, played Deep Fear on release, though. Yeah. Yeah, Deep Fear was a first-party game. It was like, I don't know, Resident Evil Killer or whatever. Their version. Yep. <laughs> and it was really hyped. It was really hyped in, in the OSSM. Yeah, KO2 would have been a much more niche game that would probably have slipped past your radar. But it was cool that you guys got it. I don't know how that happened. Yeah. I, was, I was aware of it. It was just, as a, at the time, I was a teenager, and I had very limited you know, yeah. budget for games. I didn't get a chance to play it back then. I had to wait until later. But yeah, right. deep, deep Fear, I do joke that it's the best survival horror game of 1998, which mm-hmm. uh, I do to, you know, kind of troll Resident Evil 2 fans. But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got it's, the... It's um, really good. It is. I think it's fantastic. But I think we got the, the video CD card as well. And you I did, you, you get, yeah, did. you get the video CD card. We did not get that. Yeah. Well, I, I have the Japanese, the NTSC one, you know, and um, it can play video CDs. But uh, but yeah, you you had it from I think day one, right? With all of the peripherals, we did, yeah, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, right. that's yep. crazy. Yeah, there was a an ad in like, Sega Saturn magazine, like an actual official Sega ad, obviously, and it was exactly. like, and they were all the, peripher- all the peripherals, and it was everything arcade stick arcade racer video cd card you know the the works it was everything was on there um yeah. but then would have been really used the video cd card for over here i've never right. ever seen video cds in stores it was no, like really okay so that wasn't a thing over there either no. i mean they, they say you know, it wasn't a thing over here either i mean i i do remember back in the day burning like a, a video CD or a super video CD for the dream and playing it on my Dreamcast, you know, through some kind of me. I don't even know how I did it. Use the Utopia boot or something. But I, I remember that playing Godzilla, you know, the 98 Godzilla on my Dreamcast. And it was terrible. Like it looked worse than a VHS. <laughs> but, uh, but I don't remember that being a thing for the, for the Saturn or, or even, I don't even remember you being able to buy video CDs. There was DivX. There were like DivX discs and stuff. But that was like a whole other thing, you know, that died out really quickly. <laughs> yeah. I saw, I saw, I saw a, a rack with a bunch of like it, the rack was literally about a foot and a half wide, and about you know, there was, must have been you know about three shelves of video CDs. I saw that once, and mm-hmm. uh, I remember at the time I'd seen the video CD. I, I'd seen the the ad that James talked about actually with the uh, the video CD card in there, and thinking, Do you know what, I'm going to get me one of those for my Sega Saturn and play these video CDs. No more chunky VHS. Right. By the time I actually got my Sega Saturn, the whole thing had probably you know, I never saw a video cd again so 
<laughs> it it's was... crazy how the, the machine is capable of so much, which is one of the things I kind of geek out on these days is like trying to reestablish all of the capabilities that the Saturn, you know, we, we play the thing online through, uh, through the Netlink tunnel and um, use the video CD card, use, you know, use the backup cart, just get all the stuff because the Saturn is such a robust piece of hardware with so many things that it could do. And I feel like there was a real trick missed. Uh, you guys had the video CD card. Had they brought over the OVAs, you know, like the the Panzer Dragoon OVA and the Virtual Fighter, and and made them cheap, you know, made them like ten bucks. A- any animation looks great on VCD because the it's just like bright colors, you know. So there's not a lot of compression versus like live action looks really terrible. But I've noticed actually, uh, black and white films and anime look great on the VCD card. I feel like if they had done that, you know, it would have helped kind of bolster that. Rather than just being like, well, here's a thing, but <laughs> good luck using it, you know? Aye, that, that's it. I mean, you think as well about whenever, like, if you if you registered your Saturn at launch, obviously you got, like, the kind of very fancy freebie of, of Virtua Fighter Remix and that kind of nice big cardboard box with a double dual CD inside. And, yeah. And they put the CG portrait disc as disc two as a bundle. Like, mm-hmm. put some, like, you talk about Virtua Fighter anime stuff, like, put stuff like that in there, you know, like a video CD stuff or, you know, give give people an incentive to, to maybe oh, go yeah. and buy something. But I it was just a case of, oh, there it is, it's out. Right, I, I, I never ever seen <laughs> any video CDs. Of, like you could show me a video CD on camera now and it'd be the first time I've ever seen one. Like I, I just, I never came across them at all. But that was just Sega. Mm-hmm. They just made really bizarre decisions. It's like, Somewhere in Sega, they 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 done this thinking it made sense. That, that's the thing that baffles me the most. Like this made sense to somebody to to make these decisions, <laughs> and then yeah. it's like ah. they were like, "Why not? It exists. It, it, we'll bring it over." And uh, you know, <laughs> but you guys also had let's see, you had pack in consoles. You had these like special box art. Con- I think there was like a Tomb Raider one. You know, that's right? Uh, uh, maybe another one. Not sure. I don't know, some obscure game like Theme Park or something. I don't remember, actually. But you had a couple of those where we didn't have any of that. It was just, you know, you had the round button and the oval button, and that was it for us. But you guys had some, like, you know, cool-looking boxes, which I'm also jealous of. But I'm not jealous of your cardboard long boxes for your games. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I have a few on my shelf over there. I've got the Discworld games, you know. And um, I got them in as good of condition that, as I could get on eBay. And even then, they're not great. <laughs> you know? See, the, no, the thing we... as well, I don't, I don't like the, not so much the boxes, because I think they're, they're very reminiscent of the kind of, like the, I think they're pretty similar to the American kind of mega CD boxes, aren't they? They're kind they of, are, yeah. They yeah. Are. But yeah, they are. See, see the artwork, I've always found it, see in general, the PAL region seemed to gravitate towards using Japanese box art. Mm-hmm. Whereas yeah. the American cases seem to do their own kind of like bespoke thing, and it's it's like it's if look, terrible. I, <laughs> if, if you look at like, like like Crazy Taxi on Dreamcast, for example, copies yeah. a Japanese I version, which has got the kind of lovely plain yellow with the logo, and yeah. in the US it's like a cartoon of a guy going in a taxi with people right. hanging out the back, and yeah, I, yeah, it's it's like. But I do I do hear what you're saying about the the power boxes. It's like the. You did get better clamshell boxes later, which were more reminiscent of. <laughs> am I wrong? Like they were no, more no, reminiscent. They're, they're much more like uh, modern DVD cases, but they, yeah, they're they. We, we were t- and James is laughing because we were talking about this recently, and we went off on a huge tangent on a podcast that we recorded. But they are absolutely <laughs> nigh on impossible to open. We when called you first them. Get them. Yes, we called yes, them. They chat. hurt. They hurt. you could injure yourself I, trying to open them, yeah. or like rip off a thumbnail or something. Yeah, uh, trying. Yeah, we called them chastity belts. Chastity belts. <laughs> Good luck getting this game out. Yeah. You know? You're like, but I really want to play it. That's funny. Oh my god, that's funny. I actually do think I have one of those. Um, but you know, arguably they were more durable and they did hold up over time. It's just, yeah, you're yeah. right. Like you'd struggle to open it, and then when you did open it, it would use such an explosive force that the disc would come like rattling out. Right, an eruption. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be like tumble on the floor and get scratched you know so yeah that's funny i mean of course with the i can't really say anything because with the u.s boxes the problem is that those uh hinges shatter off mm. fairly easily is what you know you really have to take good care of your stuff you know and i mean i guess if you were that kind of like curator collectionist you know and you kept good care of your stuff sure they were fine but if you were a kid playing these games you know 
you'd wrestle the thing open a couple times and you'd snap one of those little plastic hinges, you know? So yeah, it's when I was going back and recollecting games, I had to be very careful to like pay extra to get the ones that were in good condition, you know? And then of course, subsequently they released replacement cases <laughs> and I was like, darn it. <laughs> but yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of US boxes actually. I, I, I do quite like them. Um, we, we also have these gigantic. Uh, I don't know if you guys got them. These gigantic electronic arts style cases. They were, they were oh, again. They yeah. were clamshell ones, but they were enormous. They were like about <laughs> an inch and a half, two inches thick. They were ridiculous. <laughs> we didn't have anything like that that I can think of. Um, the only thing that would be non-standard would be like the working design stuff. You know, working designs. Uh, when they would release a game, they would release it on incredibly glossy paper so glossy it was like a mirror finish you know and i mean the, the manual would be just really thick and heavy um i don't think you guys had working designs releases right you would have your own like for example um what is it shining wisdom, shining wisdom you'd, yeah. you'd have your own translation of the game uh which i think was first party right uh first yeah. party soe and then we we would only get it from working design so there are differences there but yeah no all of our cases are pretty much the same it's just that uh, for for Virtual Fighter Two and for Sega Rally, for some reason, they went ahead and made them silver, silver, like a, like a greatest hits. <laughs> but it didn't say greatest hits, and it and it was done before they even were sold. So either they made them that way to stand out on the shelves because they knew they would be special titles, or they had some kind of predictable data based on their sales in Japan, and they knew that they were going to sell over a million, or I don't know. Uh, but yeah, the, subse subsequently, they both sold over a million. So they're one of the few games that did that. So, you know, you guys did have magazines, though. And um, if if you were like me, uh, that lone Saturn fan in the United States, I was like importing OSSM uh, through Barnes and Noble. I was like walking to Barnes and Noble to read the mag off the off the shelf. And it was expensive, too. It was like 10 bucks an issue. Um, can you just guys talk about that? Uh, Saturn Power... And OSSM, there was like a rivalry. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I loved them both. Um, yeah, I think there was a little bit of a rivalry in there. But uh, yeah, official Sega Saturn magazine was just absolutely legendary. Um, obviously edited by now Digital Foundry lead right, uh, Richard, Richard Ledbetter. Ledbetter. Um, yeah. And you could just tell from the way that he wrote and the way that everyone in the magazine wrote that they absolutely adored and believed in the Sega Saturn. And oh, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd pick up every single issue. Uh, it's crazy mm -hmm. that you, you imported it, but it just shows how, how good that magazine was. But it was, I mean, in my opinion, it's the best game magazine ever made. I love the British, uh, you know, what is it? A4 is it a three or a four huge uh, yeah. magazine, you know, just like, it's almost like a vinyl record. There's so much more uh, real estate for artwork and stuff, you know, and they would just plaster the magazine with, uh, artwork that they got directly from sega you know and you're right sam hickman lee nutter uh richard ledbetter all those guys um and girls uh would do an amazing job writing that magazine and just uh and, and being honest with their reviews and stuff and in a lot of cases they uh towards the end they knew that the writing was on the wall and they started covering more of like the import scene and stuff which was yeah. really cool that they did yep. that i wouldn't have known about games like radiant silver gun if it wasn't for them you know uh, they they used to kind of uh, especially like rich he would be really big on like towards the end like literally not caring that the fact they were an official magazine but like advocating that you literally go and like open up your Sega Saturn and chip it to, to play import yes, games. Like, modding, exactly. <laughs> it's oh like, my God. Yeah, we're, we're not getting X-Men versus Street Fighter, Dead or Alive or Radiant Silver Gun here, so basically go and chip your Saturn so that you can import them. <laughs> it's like, yes. It just... And and that's how they, they eked out a little bit more life. But yep. again, like, that's one thing, you know, so Bernie Stoller did have that statement, Saturn's not our future. It was in a Electronic Gaming Monthly interview, I believe. And that probably pissed off UK fans because they're like, well, <laughs> that's a big deal, you know? <laughs> I mean, that kind of like... It's going to send ripples across the world, you know, and it's going to be bad news for everybody if you're, especially if you're a Saturn fan. Um, but I mean, and I never did read Saturn Power. I don't know. I, I got the impression just from reading OSSM that it was a, that it was a crappy mag or something no, like that. It was, it was a great little mag. I mean, Saturn Power actually goes a lot further back to Sega Power, um, right. which had been around okay. for several years before. 
Uh, and that was, back. Yes, at Sega Powered by the say, well, Sega Powered, yeah. The, yeah, by Dean Mortlock, who was the editor at, at, say, at Saturn Power. Uh, and so like, really, it was just competition. It was just healthy it, competition, it right? They were yeah. like, they had to talk trash about their competition, <laughs> right? Yeah, but I bought it up. We didn't. We did not get Sega Power over here for whatever reason. Barnes and Noble, I guess OSSM, because it was the official mag, they were willing to import it, and so I got it. But it was a combination of amazement. And sadness when I saw that Dreamcast issue. It was like, I think it was Dural on the cover, shiny, yeah, the shiny chrome Dural. And it was talking about the next system. And I was just like, what? I only just feel like I only just discovered the Saturn and I'm just getting into it. And they're closing down the shop and they're like retooling for this next console that won't come out for another year. And man, that was, that was a sad day for me <laughs> reading that <laughs> magazine. I mean, what's still to this day is amazing is that, you know, Rich somehow managed to get over with, with Sega to get the first disc of, mm -hmm. of Panzer Dragoon Saga on the cover, you know, yes. and again, Panzer Dragoon Saga, a game which, again, has fallen victim to the whole, you know, retro collecting kind of either that we're in just now where it's become something of a trading card for people rather than a game. Um, but, right. like, back then... No one knew or cared about Panzer Dragoon Saga. Like, unless you were like a, a total Saturn nut or read OSSM or had your, your finger on the pulse when it came to anything to do with the Saturn, you had no idea that this game was coming. Also, there was big previews and, and issues prior because um, mm -hmm. obviously Azel had come out in, in Japan. But, you know, for them to get the first full disc, not a demo disc. Like some people still like think, oh, it was a demo disc. No, it was the first full disc. You could play the first disc off of Sega Saturn magazine, save your game, go out and buy the retail copy and keep going. And that was a, a masterstroke. I mean, I, I pre-ordered, I don't have my copy anymore, but I pre-ordered it from Gameplay.com, which was a kind of, at the time, just moved to online, but also kind of mail order, telephone, you know, um, game shop and 37.99 it cost me back then you know i could buy <laughs> you know it would cost me how much to buy it now six seven hundred quid um yeah. oh my God. so <laughs> you know and again that kind of goes back into that whole thing that bernie stoller whenever he said saturn's not our future and egm you were right and you know he, he brought that kind of whole five point plan in where only certain quality yeah. of titles would be released on the saturn so like Panzer Dragoon Saga formed part of that kind of last wave along with like House of the Dead, Burning Rangers, Shining Force 3. And you look at that as well. What what a way to find it. Like those games, okay, House of the Dead was a rushed kind of port, you know, by Tantalus who'd done Manx TT. Big and, name though. It was a big, big name. that Those titles would grace any system at that time. And they came out like with a whimper. So yeah. I, it's just, yeah. it's mental. Very few copies. I mean, you say about going in and carrying on your Panzer Dragoon, so Panzer Dragoon save from this too. I mean, obviously my story's infamous by now. My smashing my <laughs> smashing my Panzer Dragoon saga this too, and <laughs> writing into Sega Saturn magazine and Lee Nutter telling me to chin the kid and try and get a, get a copy of the game. But yeah, um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if you've seen my Sega my Panzer Dragoon saga this too. Have you, Dave? It's literally I have not. It's literally shattered. It's shattered. <laughs> yeah. Um, release day. Release day. I was coming home with it on my bike, um, as I was like literally round the corner, thirty seconds from my door. A kid kicked a football at my bike. No. I hit. I smashed into a, a fence. The disc shattered. Tr um, tried to get another copy of the game. Everywhere was sold out. Um, my mum called Sega Europe, and they said they weren't making any more. They didn't have any like spare discs to sell. Um, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to share it, share an image of it with you. It's like it's um, it's nightmare fuel for sat sat and players. So, <laughs> so I didn't. I I ended up with Sega two two Sega Panzer Dragoon Saga disc ones, <laughs> the mm -hmm. demo one and the one with the full game. I disc three you. and disc four, and absolutely no way to play the last two discs until about two thousand four two thousand and five when I managed to finally get disc two. But it was um, yeah. So yeah, all that talk about going in and carrying on your disc too that was that wasn't an option for me in the end not an but. option for you oh my god that's <laughs> that is ironic wow <laughs> well do you, i have to ask did, did either of you when you heard that panzer dragoon saga was going to be an rpg did you were you okay with that or did was there a little bit pushback from you know oh but it's not it's not what the series is you know it's not uh, being a rail shooter and everything 
Because that was me. Like when I first read about it in the magazines, I was not exactly excited for it. I was like, I don't know, from these screenshots, it just looks like it's going to slow down the action so much and it's not going to be, you know. For, for me, I, I was I was still excited about it. I, I, by that point, I was really getting into my JRPGs. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd actually bought into the Final Fantasy VII hype. I didn't own a PlayStation myself, but I was playing my friend's one. And that led me to discover games like Dragon Force, Shining the Holy Ark. And so I was really enjoying my RPGs at that point. So, and, you know, at this point I'd played Sonic R and stuff. So I wasn't, you know, afraid of my favorite, genre, my favorite series reaching out into new genres. So I thought, yeah, I love the cinematics, love all the um, story and the world building to Panzer Dragoon. So I'd love a, a I'd love yeah. an RPG, but I know, I know some people did feel that way that it would suck the, suck the excitement out of it because it wasn't action orientated. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> Aye. No, it was, again, having looked at the previews in Sega Saturn magazine, it looked intriguing. Like, obviously, Panzer Dragoon and and Zvi are are brilliant on real shooters, but what I think Saga does really well is, yeah, the pace is slowed, but the mechanics they brought into the combat, the fact that you can, as a freedom of movement, albeit when the enemy attacks you, you're kind of locked, you know, yourself, you've got the radar and there's like the kind of the green and the red zones, and you, you start to learn that your, your opponent's kind of, your, your enemy's kind of patterns and when to kind of move and sway around them. So it was really clever that it didn't do the kind of boring Final Fantasy where, you know, you get locked in place and then you <laughs> jump back. Exactly. You know, they're, they're still, they still managed to make it an RPG, but they did very cleverly capture that kind of freedom of movement element that existed still in the kind of shooting part of it. Um, and then the mechanics like, you know, the, the dragon morphing, you could, you know, switch up the skill set and things like that. And the appearance of the dragon changed depending on the skill set you chose. Oh, yeah. It's, it yeah. was such a clever, clever game. It hasn't been duplicated since. No. That, and that's the thing is, I, I was not that imaginative back then. I could not half the time see how these games were going to be realized. Burning Rangers, I thought, was a terrible idea. I was just like, firefighting in space? And then when I played it, I was just like, <laughs> this is brilliant. Like... How is it that Sonic Team is able to like just make these completely like bizarre concept, you know, high concept games, but they're just brilliant. You know, Pants Dragoon Saga, I I stood corrected when I played it. I was like, this is amazing. Like, this is fantastic. You're right. It's like this dynamic fluid motion. You're constantly jockeying for position, constantly trying to make sure that you're not leaving yourself open to a barrage of enemy fire. And it's great how you kind of zip around and get a few shots off and then go back around to like a protective position. I've always thought that like another game should come along and use that mechanic, like Mad Max Fury Road, that movie where they're all like riding through the desert, you know, imagine in cars or something like that. If you use the same mechanic to kind of like jockey around and and fire shots and stuff like that, you could use that mechanic, but they haven't, you know, Uh, and it's such a it's such a phenomenal thing. I'm hoping that one day it gets remade because more people need to play it and understand like how brilliant it was but yeah back then as a i don't know 17 year old or whatever i did not have the imagination to (laughs) to be like this is gonna be brilliant you know i was just like no they need to keep doing what they've what they've done which has been great but i'm glad that uh, i was wrong (laughs) and that it was great you know um you did mention n64 which i think that launched at like 250 pounds and then i think dropped really quickly after right even it had a hard time competing with the playstation by that time right yeah that's right i remember um because i i actually had a friend and his brother his older brother had actually imported the console from from japan uh and he you know we'd all play it and you know at the time 96 we're all blown away and people like, i can't wait for this to be available in the uk and then it launched at 250 pounds and everyone was just like everyone held off like straight away (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) a few people did buy it um but then, you know, very quickly, the price went went way down. And yeah, mm-hmm. PlayStation was still just the, the, a marketing juggernaut at that point. And then I yeah. think it was like, you could see it with Sega as well. Sega would release, re- reduce the price of the Saturn and PlayStation would respond in kind. Uh, and I think at that point, Sega and Sony have been going head to head to the point where you could get, I think I bought my Saturn was about two hundred and fifty pounds with the free games included. I think by the time mm-hmm. the N sixty four rolled around, you could probably knock a hundred pound off that. And it was the same for the PlayStation. For the N sixty four to launch as much as it did, yeah, straight away it was no one was biting. Yeah. 
And I, how did you feel about those uh, those ports, those late ports that we would get? You know, like wipeout, where we come to the con- uh, you you guys were lucky. That's another one you got. You got yeah. twenty ninety seven, and it's a great game. Plays great. Oh, I, I would argue that it feels better with the Saturn pad than it does, like you said, with the, yes. with the PlayStation. Pad. <laughs> yes, one hundred percent. The PlayStation one maybe looks a little better. I don't know. Maybe maybe the I... frame rate is better, but but you got to play it with the PlayStation <laughs> D pad, which sucks. You know, I, I mean. This, there's nothing like the Saturn pad, right? Yeah, well, it's the port, it's the Saturn analog port. Oh, that's right, yeah. it's got the analog port as well, the analog stick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. You could use the 3D control pad, yep. right? Yep. And then Resident Evil, of course, we would get that late. I don't know. Did you guys look forward to Resident Evil on the Saturn? Yeah. Again, it was one I played on PlayStation at the time, and um, James is shaking his head. He's not a fan of <laughs> not survival you, horror. <laughs> but yeah, I, I loved it on PlayStation. And yeah, playing it on Sega Saturn is actually still my favorite way to play. Even the, even the remake, I, I prefer this. Yeah. It's funny, James. Uh, Peter, my co-host for the Editor's Corner, he didn't play Resident Evil on Saturn until a few years ago. And and wrote like a he was like I just played Resident Evil for the first time on any console. <laughs> it was on the Saturn as a forty year old, <laughs> and he he loved it, you know. But it's funny back in the day, he was like Tomb Raider fan, didn't really like the survival horror thing. No, uh, so. I'm I'm a bona fide shite bag when it comes to like zombies and stuff. <laughs> Honestly, like like I watched the first season of Walking Dead grudgingly, and literally, okay. I just like. And then started season two again gradually, and I had to give up halfway through. I just I can't I can't do the whole. I'm not a horror person. It's like my, my, same for Deep Fear. Then I it's like, I've, I've I've played it, but again, it's see anything we can any suspense horror kind of stuff. Like my wife started watching <laughs> Lockwood and Co on Netflix last night, right? Mm. And I was like, oh, I see, I see, it's quite kind of what's I should watch? And it's like James, it's a twelve. I'm like <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Enemy Zero was that way for me. Like, um, I got that game and played it in the dark with my brother. And, like, you're running away from an enemy you can't see, you know, <laughs> and then getting killed, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, that that was the one that just completely scared the crap out of me. Um, but, yeah, no, I know we're running up on time. So, you know, I just want to thank both of you guys for... Uh, you know, for joining me and for being able to kind of like paint a picture of what it was like in the UK being a Saturn fan. Honestly, it doesn't sound like it was that much different. <laughs> it was <laughs> so we have a lot in common. For that. It was lonely. <laughs> it was lo- It was lonely. We're making up for it now. We know? found each other, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We all came out of the woodwork. Uh, so this, that thank God for the internet, right? You know, it brought a lot yeah. of people together over distance. You know, because yeah, we we spent many lonely years <laughs> with the set. We told everybody for years that it was a wonderful system and nobody listened and it sort of feels like like almost like we're being vindicated you know yes these, these very ang- much so these angry men in the like 40s and late 30s kind of going we told you it was good <laughs> it's like but now we're all sitting here with our expensive games that we paid next to nothing for and we're like <laughs> there you go <laughs> good luck now no but i mean it's great that you can play the saturn so many ways you know emulation ode yeah burn some discs buy the, buy the japanese copies for cheap but yeah so um, but yeah, so we, we feel mutually that we just want more people to play the Sega Saturn and experience the great games on this console. And um, thank you so much to the Sega guys, James, the Sega Holic, and Dan, the Mega Driver, uh, for joining us. And we hope everybody enjoyed listening to this. And uh, until next time, this has been Saturn Dave reminding you that you must play your Sega Saturn. Cheers. Sega! Sega!